Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Adele Jeffries, and we're going to be speaking about myopia management in New Zealand on the Myopia Podcast. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Hey, friends, Steve Keating. Uh, before we get into the show, I wanted to mention that Team has supported this particular podcast, and I'm really grateful for them reaching out to us. And they mentioned that they would like to give uh, members of the Myopia Podcast community a $250 discount off of their first virtual assistant. If you have not considered uh, bringing in a virtual team, uh, I can attest to how wonderful it is. Over the last two years, we brought in uh, about 10 team members onto our uh, practice. We've used different staffing services and we've had issues over the years with our staff not getting paid, having issues here or there, issues with the communication. And that has been really taken care of since we've joined up with team and their, uh, their group of virtual people. Uh, it's been fantastic. And I would highly recommend that you consider doing it for your office. They can do things by answer the phone for you. They can uh, check uh, insurances. They can get patients calls they can check on uh describing for you in the exam room and do a host of different things particularly in the myopia community it's great to have somebody that can be in charge of these sort of things checking on those myopic patients seeing how they're doing and giving them a care call after they've had orthokeratology for a day uh, and just kind of be a right hand to you in the exam room or to your billing team or your front desk consider higher team.com, H-I-R-E-T-E-E-M.com, or click the show notes to get the $250 discount when you sign up. Now back to the show. Thanks again for joining us. Today, we're with my friend Adele Jeffries. It is so awesome to have you here. How are you, my friend? I am good. Thank you for having me, Dave. Absolutely. This is the coolest thing that we get to talk around the world and get to have guests from all over the place. And uh, Adele recently invited me to a uh, meeting down in New Zealand, so we reconnected, and uh, we're going to talk about myopia because you're the you're the queen of all things eye care in New Zealand, and uh, have taught me a lot. Um, for those people who don't know you, tell us a little bit about you and what you do in practice and your specialties and uh, and so forth. So I am an optometrist in New Zealand. I practice in Auckland, which is our largest city, but I'm involved in a group of optometry practices all around New Zealand. So from the top of the country right down to the bottom. So I'm in practice some of the time with patients, and then I'm the national clinical manager for the Matthews Eye Care Group. So the biggest independent group of practices in New Zealand. And I'm also the president or the current president of the Cornea and Contact Lens Society, which is actually a little bit of a unique group in New Zealand in that it's ophthalmology and optometry. So we sort of work collaboratively um, in that. When I'm with patients, I um, do a lot of dry eye. That would probably be the, the bulk of my patients. But then still, I guess like you, Dave, lots of specialty contact lens work, lots of myopia management. And I think um, because I have young children, you know, the myopia management side of it is just starting to grow because, you know, it's not only those professional conversations that you're having, but it's also those conversations with my fellow parents that are meaning that more and more patients are becoming those myopia management patients. Absolutely. Yeah. So Matthew's Eye Care Group, I looked at your website and it just sounds like an incredible group. How many practices throughout uh, New Zealand are involved with uh, with your group? So we are 20, we currently sit, I should say, at 24 practices, but yeah. we are very passionate about um, independent optometry and yeah. making sure that um, New Zealanders have really high quality eye care. And we've got sort of overarching, you know, principles that guide us, but we also make sure the practices really reflect the local um, demographics so that the services that are in there, the specialties that the optometrists have really um, help the communities that the practices are in. So 24, you know, might not sound like a lot, I guess, to, um, you know, the US listeners, but in, in New Zealand terms, it's, you know, we are quite big. Yeah, well, no, actually, you know, the the number of groups 
within the United States that go above 10, there's only a handful. Um, okay. And they're, you know, the largest group that I have ever heard of was, I think, 50 um, of an independent and there was 50 practices. But beyond that, there's only a handful that are over 10. And so to hear about this group, you know, it was really exciting. I just thought it was awesome. And uh, and then the 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 cornea and contact lens group that um, the society that has been going on for quite a while, right? Your group Six, has 65 been... years. Yeah. yeah. I think we were yeah. one of the first in the world. I think we just scraped ahead of BCLA. Um, yeah. So yes, we've been going for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. And throughout the years, that's really evolved and somewhat more recently, obviously the in, in, introduction of more myopia management over the last 10, 15, 20 years, probably uh, spectacular. Well, let's talk a little bit about myopia management in New Zealand and what that looks like. So first of all, uh, you've got more products than we have. Tell us a little we bit do. about what products are being used for myopia management. We are incredibly lucky in New Zealand, I must say, for myopia management. We have a really, really broad scope and a broad range of products that we have access to. Um, Ortho K, I have some amazing colleagues in the industry and some real leaders in the industry have been doing it for a very long time. Um, Andrew Sangster, Jagrit Lalu, there's some really innovators in New Zealand. So Ortho K has got a, quite a strong footing. Um, that also is reflected with our university as well. So our key university, um, when I was going through many years ago now, we they were doing a solid amount of research on Ortho K and continue to. Um, obviously, the MySight lens, the technology um, that was commercialized, that started at the University of Auckland. So again, we've had MySight for a very long time. We've had Natural View for a good number of years. We can get Milo, um, you know, out of the um, the uh, Europe. So again, a really solid range of soft contact lens options. We um, there is movement in that space as well so you know I think a lot of us are aware that there's another major contact lens supplier um going into you know in Canada and things with um a daily disposable so that is relatively um imminent in New Zealand as well um mm -hmm. then when we look at spectacle lenses we are incredibly lucky as well we've had my smart um from Hoya for a good number of years um and also recently we've got that obviously in the photochromatic and the um, sunglass option. So we've got really good spectacle options there from Hoya, but also we have Essilor Stellist. Zeiss has just, of course, launched their MyoCare and MyoCare S, which again is um, quite innovative in the fact that it's got this age-related um, um, option with the with the two different lens types and we can get the the rodenstock one as well which I have to apologize the name has dropped out of my head but from a spectacle yeah. lens option we've got multiple designs and also of course we can access atropine the only challenge with atropine is we are still compounding it you know the nice thing about that is it gives you the flexibility to to choose the percentage that you want um, and our compounding labs are, are pretty good in New Zealand um, in terms of I think giving us a reliable product and um, there is quite a bit of work behind the scenes by um, some key people in the industry ophthalmology and optometry who are trying to get a um, a um, an over you know a prescription product that's not compounded with atropine as well because I know there's some debate about you know its place um in my pain management but it's still you know it's still used a lot um, by a lot of patients yeah. and the other thing that we have that is very new it's probably been since about March and I know only a handful of colleagues who have gone into it yet but have had really good um, results is the eye rising red light therapy so we that's that's med safe approved in New Zealand so um, I have colleagues who are starting to use that as a either as a standalone treatment for myopia management or actually as um, you know complementing other options that the child's wearing. Yeah yeah well I'd like to dig into a little bit of all of those options for you so first of all OrthoK has been used in myopia management for the longest time and you know by and large my listeners tend to be very OrthoK driven in their usage. I myself have 80% of my myopia management is within the ortho K range, but as more options are coming available, that's, you know, reducing a number a, a little mm -hmm. bit. 
So the uh, you you brought up the natural view lens, which we have. You brought up the uh, the the my sight lens, which you guys were one of the first to get, mm -hmm. uh, obviously because of your research. And then the Hilo lens. Now, is that a Mark NV product? Is that yes, uh, the Milo, right? the Mark NV Milo? Yes. <laughs> yeah, and so many people don't know that Mark NV is uh is in in included in the uh the Euclid Vision group. So I'm just saying that for everybody that they were they're now part of that group and uh a a incredible product. Do you use Mark NV contact lens? in other areas in New Zealand? I do. They do. I, I'm, I'm, I'm oddly a fan of multifocal torics and they do uh. a very good multifocal toric that goes very high in its prescriptions. So yeah. if you've got someone who really doesn't or can't be in an RGP, um, it goes... I want to say I've done somebody who's about it, you know, a minus 14 and I've had really good results. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, it takes a while for us to get down a little old New Zealand and stuff. Sure. So you've got to be, um, but it's, it's, you know, it can be a really good range of products. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a European, I believe it's from Spain, mm. if I'm correct. Yes. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, we're, we're hopeful as I'm sure many other people that will see that, that product come to, uh, come to North America. And then with regards to the spectacle lenses, I'm not surprised that you would forget a name here or there. I would mm -hmm. forget a name if I had this many myopia products to, at my disposal, but all these different spectacle lenses, Adele, in New Zealand, I'm not necessarily just speaking for you yourself, but how might one go about deciding what spectacle lens to use because you've got so many options we do is it just yeah. kind of like you know you you pick one brand and you use it or is it that people think, are differentiating so I think at the moment it's you know we don't have the knowledge about you know is 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 one particularly better than the other um I, I think you know we've got some really good options so it's that whole like you've got to do anything rather than nothing um mm. I think Sometimes, you know, Maya Smart from Hoya has been in the market the longest here. So a lot of um, my colleagues would have really good confidence with that. Um, so the, that would be one that is predominantly prescribed. Um, Stellist is um, from Essilor has been out for, you know, I want to say almost a year. Maya Care from Zeiss, as I said, that's really recent. So, yeah. you know, they've, they've presented some really good data. So I think... It depends a little bit. It, for some practices, it is going to depend on their supp supplier relationships. You know, who, what is their key lab? Who did they deal with the most? I think one of the nice things about New Zealand is there is no excuses. So our, our corporate style practices, so our OPSMs, which is a Luxottica range of practices, they can now access Stellis. So you'd find that if you went to an OPSM, the patient would be getting Stellis. If you went to a Spec Savers, which is another big corporate, you would be getting a, a the Maya Smart from Hoya. Um, if you go to an independent, I know our, our philosophy at Matthews is I want to enable our optometrists to have the flexibility to do what they think is best for that individual patient. So we have Zeiss as a as our preferred partner for lenses because they make such amazing products. But, you know, when it comes to myopia management, sometimes there's individual variations about what you want to do for the child. So um, we would do, a, we're starting to do a good number of the myocare, but we still, you know, dabble in Maya Smart and we dabble in um, Stellist and things as yeah. well. So I think, it, I think the main thing that's going to drive it is possibly going to be the business relationships, but I think we can be confident that all of them are really good products. Yeah. Yeah. So um, how about how about access to these type of lenses? You mentioned in our discussion with Hilo from Argenevi that it might take a while to get a product to you. Are there products that you've just talked about with either soft lenses, ortho K, or spectacles, we'll talk about atropine in a moment, that when you order it, it could take you know, longer than a week or two to get no, to you. There, I mean, no, there's products the, like that in the States where it takes yeah, a while to get no, to us. But... The, the Mark NV range is probably the one that would take, you know, and it's probably why we use it the less. Um, we have an amazing Cooper Vision team in Australia and New Zealand. We have, um, you know, all of those companies have really um, good supply um, chains. Yes, there's been disruptions a little bit in the last few years, but... Sure. 
No, all of them are pretty quick. Even our um, Ortho K. So, you know, I guess the two key products that are coming to mind are obviously your Paragon CRT that comes through really quickly, um, or um, iSpace, which is actually um, technology that um, is, is, is a, an amazing team actually out of Adelaide in Australia, but we have a lab in New Zealand that makes them for us. Mm -hmm. So they come through incredibly quickly. So no, we don't really have any delays even the spectacle lens labs they all have local you know manufacturing yeah. facilities yeah. and things so it most stuff is through pretty promptly so you can sort of see that patient initially and then you see them in a, maybe a week and you've definitely got everything that you need for mm -hmm. that patient so now with atropine um you're no different than most places in the world mm -hmm. with uh having to have that compounded now are there uh is there a, a a a large voice in the in the world of what concentration should we use i mean you know all the studies that we know but are people using ranges of concentrations in absolutely uh, yeah. a range of concentrations happening now i mean that, mm -hmm. that 0.02 percent i would say from conversations with my ophthalmology and optometry colleagues is probably the most used at the moment mm -hmm. you would still mm -hmm. find there's maybe a few um people using 0 0.01 that probably would tend to be more of a combination therapy but definitely you know those patients who are fast progressors and things like that um they may be going a little bit higher than um than the 0 0.02 um i think combination therapy is definitely getting more popular as well in terms of like let's add this maybe not to start with but in terms of look we know we're getting good results with x but let's actually see if we can add this in and you know yeah. just enhance things a little bit more well, that seems, you know, to, to be, you know, a big question in and atropine would be the most reasonable combination, but I, I think we're starting to see that pick up a little bit more and more and more, but uh, with colleagues that you've spoken to, have you seen that somewhat of a recent study talking about soft multifocals plus atropine not being effective mm. have influenced people not doing combination therapy or you know, and it was one study, right? There's a bunch of other studies know, that show what combo treatment is, but there's this world of like, oh, well, we shouldn't use it then. And I, I don't attest to that, that's, but. That's the hard his, thing. His, like, it's like, yeah, there's a yeah. lot, sometimes it happens, right? Where you get these really publicized studies where you go, it was well done, but it, exactly. It's one study. You've got to look at that collective um, evidence base. But I think you've also got to look at what's happening with your patients and what results you're having with your demographics in your clinic as well. Um, I think the, the main place I see combo therapy is with either with Ortho-K or again, it's with spectacle lens designs. We've got a lot of ophthalmologists who, um, you know, are, are really, I guess, still quite proactive with atropine. So us adding that spectacle option on top of it is usually um, what's happening when you're doing it in a shared care arrangement. Um, there's, you know, the, I guess the, the most ophthalmologists are still quite comfortable with us fitting them in contact lenses, but um, yeah, I think ortho K or with um, spectacle lens options seems to yeah. be probably the most commonly combo therapy that I see. How is the um, relationship with ophthalmology and myopia management compared to the relationship with optometry and myopia management? Is it pretty? We are pretty keel? good in New Zealand. We um, don't, don't, Get me wrong, there's always some issues that come up and some challenges that come up around mm -hmm. scopes and things like that. But as far as my peer management goes, I think we have a really good um, understanding that everyone's kind of wants what's best for the kid, right? So I think we're, we're working in a really collaborative way um, in terms of both, you know, day to day. Um, that happens in a lot of ways in terms of if that, if that child presents first to the ophthalmologist, they will quite proactively refer into optometry, whether that's just to do spectacles or whether that is to actually, could you take over this management of this patient? Um, the other thing is for practices that don't have axial length yet, um, particularly in a lot of regional areas of New Zealand, I know there is relationships where they've talked to their local ophthalmologist and said, could I send these children just for an axial length measurement? And they are happy to do that. And I know, you know, sometimes there's a charge, but I definitely know there's other ophthalmologists who go, no, no, don't worry about it. We'll just do that for you for free. Yeah. Um, and then from, I guess, a, um, 
advocacy perspective, we've got groups like the Myopia Action Group that are actually optometry and ophthalmology that are working together to, I guess, hopefully create change, you know, around some of our subsidies that we have for children and, and eye needs in New Zealand and around, as I said, trying to get some easier access to things like atropine um, and things like that. So there's a lot of um, collaboration on that side as well, and education. Um, but I, um, the Corner and Contact Lens Society, we put on a webinar two or three weeks ago, and it was, it was an ophthalmologist speaking about atropine, and we had an opto a couple of optometrists speaking about different aspects as well, and a really solid discussion afterwards. So no, I think oh. we're very, we're lucky in New Zealand in a lot of ways, and one of them is, yeah, yeah. I think, positive relationships between ophthalmology and optometry, and getting, you know, best outcomes for patients at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and you know, with uh, with the unity uh, of a uh, of a country not being as as geographically large and expanded, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of are forced to to work together maybe a little bit more, and that's a mm -hmm. uh, that's a really good problem to have with regards to that of of, of that unification. That's uh, that's awesome. Now you spoke of axial length, so what's the the tone and the rumblings? Is it um, you know, all the way across the board of you can't do myopia management on you unless you have axial length. Oh, are we, no. are we there think, yet or? No, yeah. I think we are, we're very much, um, I guess, particularly, I guess, with the education messaging that I do with, you know, and my, myself and co lots of colleagues do with Corner and Contact Lens Society and also, you know, within the, the private practice role that I have, it's all about do any, anything's better than nothing okay that you know myopia management is the standard of care that's what every you know child should be getting um in terms of axial length no you know we all appreciate there's always equipment and toys that we want but you know we also have to pay for these things so there's a lot of practices that have axial length that, that have invested in it so for example I would have been doing axial length for at least I want to say four years but at the same time for those 24 practices that I help um, do the clinical management for we don't have it in every practice mm -hmm. um, so yes there is a swing to practices starting to invest in it but I, I think everyone appreciates that that doesn't need to be what stops you doing my peer management. Yeah, you should be agreed. doing it regardless. Yeah, agreed. Now, um, can you give people kind of a perspective of independent optometry versus you mentioned two different groups, spec savers being one of them, and from my observation in in Europe and in Australia and New Zealand. That, that makes up a, a large percentage of the marketplace for eye care. Is that true? And do you? Oh, it does. A... Yeah, no, it does because it's, you know, they have a bigger footprint. Um, so they have more doors. So they are more accessible to some extent. You know, they have a, yeah. a, a lot of practices. And I think you've got to have, you know, in any market, you've got to have accessible, cost effective eyewear. Um, they run on a different appointment style. Um, you know, each business model has a slightly different you know structure in terms of how they do their appointments what equipment they invest in how they train their staff and things like that um so most independents that I know would run a slightly longer appointment time would mm -hmm. have um maybe slightly more in-depth equipment in terms of rather than just that basic overview they you know would be in you know investing in things like IPLs um investing in things like maybe doing red light therapy you know doing more ortho k and specialty contact lenses rather than you know out refer referring that kind of thing yeah yeah and how is myopia management embraced in that corporate setting you mentioned spectacle my lenses. um yeah so my it's something that they have started um from i guess you 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 can argue that um it's an outsider's perspective because i don't work within that um that practice setting but sure. my understanding is they have put a lot more focus on it in in the last year or so which I think is brilliant I think it's in the best interest of every child coming through our doors so I think it's a good thing that they're starting to do it um mm -hmm. they um do have access to products now which is is good right because mm -hmm. again rather than the child just getting given single vision spectacles they are actually giving them something so they are both starting to do more myopia management they both as i said have a spectacle on board now and they both can access my site as a as a contact lens one of the yeah. things i guess about our suppliers is again there from the conversations I've had because again I don't want to put words into anyone's mouth but the conversations I've had is that they're very much on that same philosophy of that 
it's in the best interest of children to have access to these products. So they're not going to say, well, look, you're, you, you don't do our lenses, so we're not going to give you our myopia management lenses. As when it comes to myopia management products, they just want them to be available. So they will provide them to yeah. anybody, which I think is, again, when we're thinking about best interest of the children, that's a good thing. So it is good, I think, that, yeah, the, the, those corporate style practices are starting to do more myopia management and actually having options for patients. You know, there's there there is not a lot of um, corporate eye care practices that are doing myopia management in North America. There's some, but not mm. a, a huge percentage of it. Which, but that will come mm. when, as you've seen this kind of evolving. How has the economics of myopia management changed? for private practices, per, for the independent practitioner, as those other corporate entities have come on? Are, are yeah. there are there pricing things way lower or yeah, kind of equivalent? No, we, uh, the pricing, my understanding at the moment is the pricing is relatively equivalent. Um, mm-hmm. I think, uh, you know, a lot of us who work in independent practice um, would have the benefit of experience. And so if you've got a parent who's looking for somebody who's been doing it for a very long time, um, can give you, you know, spend a bit more time talking about options um, and again, having a broad set of options rather than saying, well, this is one or two options that I can give you. Um, the, the parents do start to search people out. I've got some colleagues who have really strong followings because they have been doing it for so long. And, you know, like a lot of things, you get a, a good reputation um, and that creates followings. We do things like, um, you know, talk to schools. We, um, I thought I was saying earlier, I was talking to teachers yesterday and even um, it was one of the conversations that came yesterday was, you know, actually telling the teachers, you're going to see more kids wearing contact lenses. And it's sort of, they said, if a child had told me that, that I sleep in contact lenses overnight, I think they were lying. Um, <laughs> but so it's one of those things. I think, you know, sometimes we have, you know, as independents, we have often more time, right? Well, we choose to have more time mm-hmm. and whether that's in the appointment length and our ability to talk to the patient and, you know, some patients want and, and need that, um, a bit more care and attention whereas of course the corporates have a slightly faster pace as I said potentially less of a range of products to choose from but at this point no I haven't pricing seems to be relatively yeah. similar and, and yeah if uh if you had axial length in your clinic how many times would you anticipate seeing a myopic child over the course of a year I like to see most of them it's every three to six months I think if it's a new a relatively new patient to me, mm-hmm. I'll see them every three months. And some of those appointments can be really short and it's about checking in and, you know, aiding compliance, really. I'm a big um, believer and it's the same with, you know, dry eyes. Those little check-ins and follow-ups really help you reinforce yeah. um, the advice that you're giving them. Yeah. Um, and also making sure they understand everything they should be doing because sometimes you can pick up little things about how they might be looking after their lenses so you can prevent problems um and I like to get a really good understanding about you know what's this individual child doing um I think one of the other shifts is we used to wait for demonstrated progression um so you'd wait to see you know is this child progressing at a faster rate than we expect because of course we always expect some change it's a it's a rare patient that you go no we've completely stopped them right Mm -hmm. to some degree some progression is normal because that child is growing so I like to get a sense of how is this child progressing and I think sorry there's sort of a shift in terms of wait rather than waiting for progression we're now just going no we're just going to go myopia management straight away um so because of that I think those three months checkups initially to make sure that you know is what we're doing really helping this this individual child um if there's somebody that I've been seeing for a little while and I can think of a a friend's daughter who I know is booked in on Monday I definitely see them every six months or so but then at the same time there's always that open dialogue about any concerns always just touch base right yeah yep um is there a variability to pricing structures between uh, eye care providers all throughout the country or is it tend to be that um everybody does it somewhat the same with some variability in price and let me let me give you a clarification i've heard of people who will charge a monthly or a global fee. I've heard of people who charge uh, 
we've had podcast episodes where we've talked about all these different pricing strategies yeah. where people will charge every time the patient comes in. So you come in for your three month visit, you get a charge, you come in for your fitting visit, you get a charge, you get, you know, th there's that. Uh, global would include all of the visits plus mm. the lenses. And then the other, uh, the other aspect um, uh, uh, around that is, and I I'm laying you a lot of different things to answer here, is there a variability in the pricing if I go to spectacles versus soft multifocals mm -hmm. versus orthokeratology? Can you answer that as a nation for me? As a nation? No, <laughs> probably not. Um, someone would, yeah, oh, I'll get hit up by someone going to tell you. You said completely the wrong thing. Um, <laughs> my my impression is that these are real, these are real mats. Um, yeah. It tends to be, it depends on what, myopia option the parent and the family and the child chooses um you know sometimes price comes into that because for better or worse if they're just doing atropine to start with in a pair of glasses probably the cost is slightly less than if you're doing ortho k ortho k tends to be a package in terms of this is all the appointments and the lenses and things to get you started and then there'd sort of be ongoing costs from there um spectacle lenses tend to be a one-off the great thing about all of the spectacle lens suppliers is they have really solid warranties yeah. around if there's been a certain change in the um, spherical equivalent you will be able to replace that set um, at no cost so they do have really good warranties around um, progression of the myopia um, but generally it tends to be a bit of a mishmash of there's some packages typically around ortho k or a soft contact lens fitting so my site for example um but if it's just glasses and then you're doing a follow-up you would yeah it would be well i think we need to see you every three months so yes every time you come in it's going to be x got it yeah Okay. And so there's variability between the types of treatments that you're doing and all throughout the country, it's going to kind of be variable, which is, yeah, which is I haven't kind heard of similar. too many outliers in terms of anyone being like ridiculous. Like everyone seems to be, and there's no collusion or discussion mm -hmm. about that, but from what mm -hmm. you hear, you know, just in your general chit chats, everyone seems to be around a similar yeah. area. Yeah. 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 Well, we're all on the same rock that's rotating around the sun, but, uh, you know, in different places in the world, you're leading us or you're trailing us in the United States. And is the, my, my listeners are worldwide, but the vast majority of us are in North America. And our big question is how does myopia management change as more corporate eye care providers come into the market, uh, and do myopia management, for for the better for kids that's the big yes. thing and then the second one uh you know really is how do spectacle lenses change this and so it's always so brilliant to be able to talk with colleagues in canada and colleagues in yeah. australia and new zealand and in in uh in europe to hear about all of these different aspects and so i i'm super appreciative of your insights yeah. into all of these different areas that's okay. I mean, it's nice having the spectacles because, you know, I'm sure you guys would appreciate there's always a handful of kids who don't want to look at contact lenses or you think, well, they don't want to look at contact lenses, so I've only got atropine, but it's not doing what I want it to be doing. Yeah. So th that is the nice thing about having the spectacle options. And then a lot yeah. of patients, you know, if they're in my site they have a myopia controlling spectacle for when they're not wearing their contact lenses. So uh, yes, we want the child wearing, you know, the option that we're choosing the vast majority of the time to get the greatest efficacy, but it, it gives you that option for when they, you know, for when they've, you know, got a, an eye infection or they've got a, um, you know, a cold, so they shouldn't put their contact lenses in. Um, so that is the nice thing about having the spectacle lens yeah. options is that you actually yeah. have at all, yeah and they they work you know they, yeah they do they do the research yeah, is yeah. pretty clear yeah well awesome i appreciate you uh hanging out on the myopia podcast any any closing marks on behalf of your entire nation <laughs> no it would probably be it probably i just probably need to do a thank you to to the my colleagues in the new zealand and to be honest the australian industry because I think as well as being quite progressive and having some amazing colleagues and friends who have been 
at the forefront of this, I think the other thing we've got is a really good culture of sharing knowledge and mm. that we're all really happy to talk about what's working for us in practice, what success we're having with products. Um, we've got a very positive knowledge sharing culture and I think that just benefits us all as individuals and that then um, helps all our patients. Yeah. Well, having been to New Zealand and Australia, I can attest that it's an incredible culture of community. And, you know, that's that's a really cool thing about the Cornea and Contact Lens Society and the groups that you've got is uh, how that all works out. So, well, I appreciate you being on the show and thank you for Thanks listening for to the Myopia podcast. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, make sure to like and subscribe and stay tuned next time for more episodes of the Myopia podcast. Thanks for listening to this episode. I want to again thank Team for their support of this particular podcast. Uh, they have been a great supporter of the Myopia community, helping to uh, make clinicians and offices run better, whether it's calling and scheduling appointments, whether it's answering the phone, helping with billing issues, scribing in the exam room, whatnot. Having a virtual team member in your practice is a real show stopper. So with that, I want to thank team again for their support. Check them out at hireteam.com. That's H-I-R-E-T-E-E-M.com or click the notes in the show description below. Thanks again to team. One, two, three, four. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.